Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. As you can see, I've got my signature. Tom's got, my, got a shot on my signature tie right here. Boy, the kids are going to be happy. They're all happy and they're smiling. A, a multitude of kids here, all various ethnic groups and various cultures and those the display of the flags and whatever. This is, I mean, boy, I tell you, this is going to be something else. These kids are really happy. And I guess what I'm talking to and I'm really going to is the fact that the fact that we got a guy here that's going to be here for kids on the school, Portland School Board. A gentleman by the name of Steve Buell. You've seen Steve here before. And so what I'll do, I'll just read this, uh, one, of the, one of the many, if you will, announcement about the, uh, the victory, uh, and that this one appeared in the Tribune, and I'm just going to read a couple of things in it. Buell will rejoin Portland Public Schools Board after victory. Former Portland School Board member Steve Buell scored an upset victory Tuesday night, taking the Zone 4 seat from incumbent Martin Gonzalez. Unofficial results for the school board race gave Buell a victory by a 50% to 44% margin. Buell, a former teacher and school board member in the late 1970s and early 1980s, had the endorsement of the Portland Association of Teachers, folks. How about that? Teachers. And then, here we go. Here, this is Steve Buell said he's looking forward to addressing several of the issues that were a major part of his campaign. We need to manage the testing so we are sure we are providing a good, solid, well-rounded education on not just a testing culture, Buell said, Teachers' morale needs a boost. We need to do a better job of respecting them and including their thinking in decision making. Boy, what a relief! And guess what? We're going to start off the program before we brought, bring Steve on. We're going to we're going to bring two teachers that supported Steve, like many other teachers also did. And again, I've got two individuals here: Suzanne Cohen and also Matt Olson, both of which are teaching here in the Portland Public School Arena. Here, uh, Suzanne is at Peninsula. Uh, K-8, and Matt Matthew is a teacher at Lent School. Welcome to Thanks. I guess you're happy too, right? Very happy. All right, all right, all right. So what we're going to do is that um, uh, with these two two individuals, that we're going to give them an opportunity to give you a feel for one, what qualifies them to be a teacher. They'll give you a little background in terms of where they, where they, where, where they went to school and how did they get into this business and how did they come to Portland and in the Portland Public Schools arena, okay? So why don't we start with you, Suzanne? Let's talk about yourself a little bit. Uh, I um, am from Miami, Florida, and my undergraduate degree was with sociology, and I was really very interested in how could I participate um, in our society and just kind of make it a better place. I was in my 20s, and, oh, okay. um, but social justice was really very important to me, and I also did a lot of theater and drama, and mm. then kind of in a full circle way that things happen. I moved to Portland and realized that I really wanted to be an educator and that public education was specifically very important to me and to be able to get involved in that. School was such a great opportunity mm -hmm. for me to just really delve in and um, find all the different things that interest me and I really enjoyed school. Was so. that your study as far as teaching? Did you get your teacher certificate? Yeah. Not till not till I went to grad school. Grad I didn't school. realize when I was a sociology major that that's what I wanted to do. But then when I moved to Portland, I went to Portland State for my teaching license and my master's in education. And how long have you been in, in the Portland Public School District? This is my 10th year teaching. 10th year. Tenth okay, year. we'll get a little bit more about your background <laughs> and whatever and so what you're doing in the classroom. And Matthew, what about yourself? Uh, I was born in the uh, enormous city of Brookings, Oregon. You know okay. where that is? Oh, Brookings. Oh, yeah. yeah. I fished there a couple of times. Oh, yeah? Okay. So <laughs> that's about 10 miles from the California border yes. on the Oregon coast. Uh, my dad uh, was a teacher. He's a retired teacher now. My mom was a speech pathologist. And uh, during that time in Brookings, this is interesting, so my father was a teacher there, and I qualified with the teacher salary. I qualified for free and reduced lunch from mm. the school district that employed my dad. Really? So... Uh, so I've been, you know, exposed to not only uh, the teaching profession all my life, but mm -hmm. also what it means to be on the free and reduced lunch thing. So I ended up going to college in Seattle, uh, did my undergrad there, and then I got my first teaching job in Los Angeles in 2004, teaching middle school ESL there. And then I moved back to Oregon in 2008 to teach here in Portland. So. And that was your degree was in the teaching? Is that how you got your certificate then? Uh, yeah, in L.A. I got my, you know, I, I studied um, economics, economics and mm. Spanish. Oh, so. Cool. Uh, 
Now that makes sense. Now I teach, right? Yeah, okay, good. good. <laughs> so I, I teach bilingual ed at Lent School. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. great. So let's talk about the classroom. What, you know, and your involvement in the classroom, Suzanne and the band, let's, let's open it up. Let's let's educate the public about that. One, let's talk about what you do in the classroom. How, you, what sort of response you're getting from from the kids in the classroom? Okay, and what, then at the same time, maybe talk about some of the you know the response you're getting from administration in terms of the concerns you have in terms of getting things done, if you will. Okay, so then what? I teach a seventh grade math and science, and so teaching middle school math is very interesting. By the time they get to seventh grade, a lot of students uh, say that they don't like math or that they aren't good at math. Um, and then you, you hear those concerns echoed by parents too, like, oh, well, math wasn't really my subject. So mm -hmm. it start, the school year starts with this hurdle of, you know, the first step before they can even learn math is to convince kids that they are good at it and it is fun and they all like it. So we do. Um, a really great job of making it um, culturally relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And so whatever we're doing in math, we, it always starts with either relating to something they know or teaching the storyline behind it. So for graphing animals, we talk about our pets at home. Or um, when we studied a r slope and rise and run, we actually went out and looked at some steps. And mm -hmm. I think that first step is the buy-in that kind of makes it fun for the kids mm -hmm. and, and helps them really enjoy the math and then usually by the end of the year most kids feel very confident mm. that they are good at math they like math math is their favorite subject mm. so that's very exciting and rewarding mm. for me you, you know as i was thinking you're saying about math back in my days it was you know the one and one is two that type of routine mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they changed and went into the new math and then for the benefit of the viewing audience is, is, is there a difference or were you familiar with the the transitioning yeah, well, that's what I was not a math major or math okay. superstar. Actually, I mean, if my if I could get in touch with my middle school math teacher, I think uh, it would be very ironic that now I am a middle school <laughs> math teacher. So, math was not my favorite subject at all, and I think um, it was because of the it was very formulaic. Just just pay attention, follow instructions, do it this way, and and I didn't pay attention, <laughs> and so I didn't really like it, and it was. When I was in grad school, that they they retaught us math, and so you know our math is base ten, and it, we had to relearn math base five just so we could go through the process of what it means to learn math. So I think it's hard for parents, even if they are very good at math themselves, to help their students with the mathematics because now there's a real focus in not just getting the answer, but the process, explaining it, mm. lots of um, manipulatives and toys, even in the middle school math um, classroom, to really get them to understand why it is that way. And for me, that made it way more meaningful and, and makes it really fun to teach, and I think the kids really like it that are way, we, too. Are we able to bridge the gap between them, the old math with, from the parents' standpoint and the kids? Because that's, that can be an issue, because the idea is you want the parents to be involved, right? So what do you do about that? You know, there's always, uh, with my sociology background, mm -hmm. when you look at theories, there's like this constructivist theory, mm -hmm. and then there's direct instruction theory. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, of course, to be effective, you've, you've got to rope them all in it and do everything. So uh, with parents, I've always invited them to come be in our classroom. I send home letters kind of explaining it or bridging it. Um, though, though parents are very good at getting the answer, they're not always very good at understanding why. So sometimes I'll ask families the same questions I'll ask the middle school kids. Like many people know that when you divide fractions, you flip the reciprocal and multiply. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But if you actually ask them to come up with a word problem, you know, when, why would one fourth divided by one half? Mm -hmm. You know, they actually ended up multiplying and they didn't know the word problem. So that kind of helps with some buy-in about why you need to understand what you're doing mm -hmm. and kind of makes it more. So it is an issue, so to speak. It is somewhat of an issue. Definitely. Okay, okay, good. Matt, how about you? What, what's your involvement? Talk, talk about your your classroom involvement. Uh, well, what, right now what I'm doing at Lent School is I'm growing a bilingual program. So mm -hmm. about five or six years ago, uh, they started a Spanish immersion program at Lent. And it started as uh, kindergarten. And in kindergarten in a Spanish immersion program, it's 90% uh, in Spanish, 10% in English. And then in first grade, it's 80% Spanish, 20% English. Then second grade, 70%, 30%. And it ends up being about 50-50 by the time they get to fifth grade. And I'm now teaching sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So about five years ago, we started a bilingual program uh, at Lent. I wasn't there yet. Uh, and they, they had me go over to Lent to teach the middle school. So this year I teach sixth grade Spanish immersion, uh, which isn't Spanish per se. I teach uh, history in Spanish and I teach language arts in Spanish. And mm -hmm. next year I'll be teaching sixth and seventh Spanish immersion. So uh, what's really cool about 
immersion and language is that you really get to honor the, the language that the kids speak, uh, for the Spanish speakers, the kids speak at home. Mm -hmm. So uh, they grow up with that sense of pride of where they come from. And then for the non-native speakers, they get to add a language. So that's what I'm doing right now half the day. The other half of the day I teach uh, ESL, which is now called Emerging Bilinguals, so English mm -hmm. for kids who need extra English. So, yeah. And what, what about the composition of the students in there? Are they all basically folks from, uh, you know, the, what is Spanish, uh, Latino? Uh, what, what? So the idea is to have a mixed class. A mixed class. That's okay. the idea. Okay. The class I have now is pr primarily Latino, Latino, primarily Spanish okay. speakers at home. Okay. But some classes coming up. Are, are more mixed so you have non-native speakers and, and the native speakers so mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and what about the other languages in doing in that same er area basically like like French and I think and, Portland yeah. public has uh, Portland public has Chinese immersion okay. uh, Japanese immersion uh, Russian immersion and Spanish immersion okay so, yeah. okay so that's why that's where you well, what do you think is it working yes it is working yeah it's working um, I think also what we should add is is world languages, right? So it shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be limited to just people who started speaking uh, started in the program in kindergarten. We should have we should we should open up the the curriculum in middle school. We should have French electives, mm -hmm. Spanish electives. Mm -hmm. We should have Japanese and Chinese electives early They're on. They're not doing that now. No, no. They're uh, not doing that now. What happens now? I, th I think there are some electives in in high school for students. Uh, the problem, and, and we'll probably get into this later, we, we have, because of this whole, uh, this mania with testing that started mm -hmm. with No Child Left Behind, we've had a narrowing of the curriculum. Starting in third grade, we have a uh, standardized test called OAKS, and they're tested in math and reading, standardized being as a question, and you have to respond A, B, C, or D. Mm -hmm. um, because a huge, uh, I guess we've concentrated on those two tests so much that things like other languages, things that not necessarily, that can't necessarily be tested have kind of gone out the door. So right now we have kind of a n narrowed uh, curriculum, uh, I feel, right? Because teachers are pressured to raise two test scores, math and reading. So mm -hmm. I'd like to move away from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, back in the early days, what I, I, I'm thinking I'm talking from a layman's standpoint aspect of it. When you hear about, heard about the ESL, you talk about Spanish, and people thought about the Spanish aspect right. of it. But what about the certification of the teachers? At one point in time, it was as if they, they weren't certified. I mean, is that still is that still part of the process? As far as the yeah. teachers are concerned, are they certified teachers? Or, the, or, the teachers. Spanish, let's say Spanish. On the, on the, well, they teach the languages. Uh, Do you have to be a certified? Yes, yes. you have to be certified. Yeah. Okay. So, so I have. Um, hope my principals aren't watching. I have. Uh, uh, <laughs> I have thirteen certifications, so I can okay. teach uh, a variety of things. Oh, really? So, and you, and you have to be certified to teach uh, okay. a certain area. Okay. Yeah. There's some ways that there's some different rules and regulations, but you have to be have to mm -hmm. be certified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just thinking in terms of my history and in mm -hmm. terms of what I remember, so to speak, yeah. about this issue was the fact that they had to bring folks in who had. A mastery of Spanish, but no, not necessarily they were certified. Oh, but but that's not the case you have today. Have both now, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that's right. Okay, well, again, let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, again as far as parent involvement. Again, I, I think both of you were, were still still trying to put that together, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Fair. Let's talk about have parents, parents involvement. be yeah, more involved. More involved. Sure. How, how, how do you get them involved? You know, well, that it's. That's a very good question. It depends. I mean, for just like with every child, how do you get a child more involved in your classroom? Mm -hmm. It's about relationship building. Mm -hmm. I think you, with different students, there's different ways to get them to have more buy-in, and I think with families, we're seeing that too. I mean, obviously, reaching out to parents in their native language is an important mm -hmm. step. Also, recognizing that for different families, school had its own. Some families loved going to school and some parents didn't and so recognizing that when they come and, and that ultimately they are entrusting you with their child mm -hmm. and um, you know giving them the respect and equal partnership in outcomes for their student is a basic way we start. At Peninsula we do some really wonderful parent nights and involvements, a lot of like fun stuff, but as, as a teacher parent involvement is tricky, especially with middle school kids because the kids kind of are like, I don't want my parents there. and. Um, and then the parents are a little bit sometimes intimidated by the curriculum, but really just making it opening and welcome. I've definitely offered to help parents who are pursuing GDs or going back to school with their own math tests that they have to take to get in. And I find really great field trips. The best way to get parents involved is like the better the field trip, the more parents are coming. And we did a partnership with a, a farmer out in Woodburn, and it was the tulip farm. Mm -hmm. And we got to go and visit the tulip farm, and so many parents came. We just filled the school bus with the equal amount of parents. 
parents and kids, everybody wanted the tulips. So I think um, just like kids, um, when you make it fun and meaningful and relevant, that's the first step and then you can ask for more after that. You know it's been said that over 50 percent of the of the kids are under the food program, right? The free to reduce lunch? Yeah. The, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah but in the Portland Public mm -hmm. School District, what impact does that have in the classroom? Have you, have you noticed anything along that line? A lot of impact. Have you? <laughs> Matt? So my school Lent school, I think it's 87 percent, so it's 80, 80, 80 to 90, Yeah, so we're out on 97th, so it's, it's a high percentage of kids on free to reduce wow. lunch. So uh, what, we, um, what we need are, I mean, we can do a lot in the classroom, but we mm -hmm. absolutely cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. so, uh, are you expected to do anything? Do you see yourself being... being it, it's funny because we didn't like, get into the profession for, for money you know, right, or fame, right? right? So, so we will do as much as we can. Mm -hmm. We will do as much as we can, mm -hmm. but uh, we, we, we absolutely cannot do everything. So uh, um, we teach from... Your school starts earlier, huh? We teach from 8, I teach from 8.40 to 3 o'clock. I do everything I can from that point in time. Mm -hmm. And I open my classroom up after school to help kids as mm -hmm. well till about 3.45. This is on your own? Or is this something that... Uh, it's on my own. Part of your yeah, yeah. And, and that's when I'll communicate with parents after school. Mm -hmm. um, but the kids also need, you know, they need the dental care. They mm -hmm. need the, the health care. They need um, after school sports. Mm -hmm. right? We don't have sanctioned PPS after school mm -hmm. sports. They need after school sports. Uh, they need after school programs like music and art and things they can really get, mm -hmm. get involved in. Um, and I mean, it looks like funding's increasing now, but I'm hoping it's going to go towards something mm -hmm. like that. The wraparound services that teachers can't do, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and if they don't come to school, then I mean, you can do so much with them when they're in your classroom, yeah. but attendance is a really big issue. There's a lot of, I know I, I have one student that um, whenever Head Start is closed or whenever the, the preschool sibling is ill, mm -hmm. it's her responsibility to stay home. And she will come after school once mom gets home to take care of the kid mm -hmm. to have me reteach the lesson, mm -hmm. which I do on my own time, because here's a kid that's doing everything right and really wants to get ahead. But, I mean, money is a priority, food's a priority. Also, I mean, just recognizing how, how you know, the kids have to be fed before they can mm -hmm. learn. And that um, in order to be receptive and to buy in that, you know, solving proportions is important, you have to have all your other basic needs met. So if you're concerned or stressed out about home. Like food proportions? <laughs> right, right. Wow. But you're right. You need enough food. You need to know right. that you're not getting evicted yeah. from your mm -hmm. home, right. that you have clothes. And you're dealing with all these kinds of things. Yeah, right. and the better our wraparound, I mean, I know at Peninsula we've added programs over the years, and, and the more programs we have and the more effective, then, then the better the kids are coming to us ready to learn. But, um, you know, if, if they've got, I mean, like any of us, mm -hmm. we've got our priorities, mm -hmm. and it, they're logical ones. Now that we've talked about that part of it, I mean, I, I think about your immediate supervisor, I say superintendent, so mm -hmm. to speak, and then naturally she's got a supervisor, it's called the board. Right. <laughs> you know, and uh, have, uh, do you feel that they are familiar and, concern and, and, and uh, are aware, if you will, of the, some of the issues that you're having at the classroom, and are they responding? I think they're concerned, but the lack of familiarity... Um, Guide, misguides a lot mm -hmm. of people. I mean, I think everyone is well, not everyone, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are well intentioned mm -hmm. and, and want kids to be successful, but um, are really not aware of what's going on in the classroom or, or what, what it takes to actually educate a child and, and all the, the emotion and the passion mm -hmm. and, and all mm -hmm. those untestable skills that it, a teacher has to have that I didn't take a test for to get mm -hmm. into grad mm -hmm. school and, and all those other things I'm doing for my students that aren't being measured on a standardized mm -hmm. test. Well, boy, here we go again. Now, <laughs> now here comes the big deal here. Now, now all of a sudden you're out there, there's an election here and, and there's uh, two people running for the school board, uh, one of which is an ESL guy, Gonzalez, if, if you will, and, and, uh, and you know, boom, uh, there's, there's really not a teacher on the school board per se or whatever and all of a sudden this guy comes up and and he starts talking to you all about hey I'm running for the school board His name was Steve Buell when did you first meet him and how did he how, how did you feel about it uh, I really started getting familiar with his positions he he there was a debate at uh, Concordia University okay. one, one, of, one of the first ones and I, I was impressed with uh, how um, he could connect the micro issues with uh, the macro issues so what does that mean in late terms? So <laughs> yeah, right. This might yeah, be you know, yeah, economics yeah. coming through. Okay, all right. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so micro would be the classroom, okay. right? For example, last year I taught fifth grade last year at a different school, a beach school, right up in North Portland. Okay. So uh, I had thirty-three kids in my classroom, and within there I had plenty of uh, gifted kids. 
I also had plenty of uh, ESL kits. I had uh, a few special ed kits. So we have gifted, ELL, special ed, all in the same class. And uh, I was teaching all, all 33 of them. Mm. Um, that's a micro issue that some people don't understand. So I was differentiating at a very high level and then I was bringing a lot of kids up. Mm -hmm. So there's one micro issue that you understand by doing it, right? You have to have done that to understand it and not done it just maybe a year or two, like year after year after year. And even towards the end or, or right now, I'm still adding new things. I'm learning new things about how to differentiate. So, so Steve Buell brought that to the table, the micro issue. And then in the debate, I was hearing him connect the macro issues to it. So the macro issues come from Washington, D.C., the macro issues come from Salem. And unfortunately, with No Child Left Behind and our race to the top, those macro issues have revolved around testing. Like I talked earlier about how the concentration on two test scores has narrow narrowed our curriculum mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was impressed how he connected the micro in the classroom with the macro mm -hmm. coming from DC, mm -hmm. coming from, from Salem. And uh, I don't see that on very many school boards anywhere. So mm -hmm. I was impressed mm -hmm. by that. Yeah. How about you, Suzanne? It, it was just a, a, an overwhelming breath of fresh air um, when, when I first heard uh, Steve talk, or when I first realized that he was going to run for school board, because there are many w well-intentioned people that run for school board, but the clear difference was he really knew what he was talking about and had real tangible examples and knew what was going on in Portland public schools and was able to speak to them and had real good ideas and solutions about what could happen. And I was just instantly elated as soon as I heard him speak and knew he was running for school board. And I was like, we have to get behind this guy. <laughs> like, this could really help us you know this is an amazing opportunity for us as teachers mm -hmm. to have a teacher on the school board mm -hmm. what about what do you think about some of the other teachers uh, i'm sure you were probably involved in some of the what, what were some of their, their response if you will to steve running for the school board except for me winning any other thoughts oh, within portland public yeah, other yeah. teachers portland public schools, they i mean they were refreshed to see someone speaking about our issues all right they saw a teacher uh, uh a retired teacher who was talking about what happens in a classroom mm -hmm. and uh, how school board uh, decisions uh, affect us. So um, it, it seems common sense to have a teacher on the school board, but it doesn't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So school board, teacher, seems like that would go together, but it doesn't happen all the time. So. Why is that so? I mean, you would think that would be a natural deal that at least, you, at least one spot should be a, a someone that you, has from the classroom, if you will, should be on the board to educate the others. In, in every aspect of so. decision making yeah, around education, yeah, yeah. Um, there should be teacher input. We yeah. are the ones that know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was one of the great things about Steve Buell. He got that piece too, not just on the school board, but you know, from any small level right. about like what is Portland Public Schools doing with its bond to within Salem or at the federal level, all these decisions are being made by people who don't, who haven't taught, who haven't mm -hmm. been inside the classroom and don't know. So yeah, we it, technically a teacher is not, you can't be employed by the district and be on the school really? board but and they view that as a conflict yeah. of interest but I mean it's quite the opposite in my opinion yeah, like so. why wouldn't you want yeah. a practicing educator on the school board but when my teacher friends you know that I was trying to say like we've right. got the Steve Buell and there was just I mean it was very there's just only a few talking points that you had to mention to convince any other educator that Steve Buell was going to be great on the school board and the first thing I always said is he was a teacher mm -hmm. and you can you can feel the frustration amongst teachers from every district in the lack of teachers voices mm -hmm. and input in decision making and just hearing that there could be a teacher involved was already a great selling point and then just talking about his value for all the subjects not just the tested ones um, I mean that's something that every teacher could really get behind we all miss what, art. What's the present flow if you will of a concern to say uh, Matt if you have a concern, have a concern and what's your present flow from the standpoint of getting that concern to someone a decision maker to, to respond to your concern what's the flow you know what talk like to what the happens principal. now yeah what happens? I would talk to the principal now and then, right. then what happens uh, the principal may uh, hear it and make a decision based on it or it may stop right there so uh, yeah that's pretty much yeah I've had some fantastic principals who who do stuff and mm -hmm. then I've had the exact the exact opposite mm -hmm. where where it stops and granted uh, they are um, overwhelmed with this testing culture as well. Mm -hmm. So they uh, are being pressured to care about a couple things, and those are test scores. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not that they're bad people, it's that uh, 
they're, they have been concentrate. They have been the system has asked them to concentrate on raising these certain test scores, mm -hmm. right? So if you ask them something that's maybe out of that realm, they they don't have uh, I guess uh, it's not in their best interest sometimes to address it because they're concentrating on these tests. Mm -hmm. So. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. Well, you know, so one of the major concerns with many of my viewers is the fact that uh, Portland, Portland Public School has one of the highest failure rates in the entire state. And they're very concerned, you know what I mean, from that right. standpoint. As far as dropout. And, and concerned about the fact that the, the, they, they want to make sure that the teachers are given the opportunity, if you will, to spend the time in the classroom, mm -hmm. hopefully the kind of numbers being able to reach these kids, et cetera. And you've got a tough, tough job, especially in the Portland, Portland Public School District, mm -hmm. the largest school district in the state, for that matter. And as, as we talked about before, the number of kids that are on the, 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 the lunch program and things of that nature and, and having to spend quite a bit of time talking to other things and responding to other issues with the child as opposed to spending more time with them teaching them. Fair? Right. Okay. So as, so as we talked about this flow situation, okay, now all of a sudden you, you've got a situation and you've gone to the principal and said, look, here's a something and I think we might be able to change this to do a better job, et cetera, et cetera. You go to the principal and says, okay, I'll look at it. Comes back to you, well, no, we're not going to do it. Then what happened? Will you have any other recourse? You know, I, I view my job primarily as advocating for my students, right. and I'm in a great position right now where I can still do that. Okay, okay. Um, and protecting my job, I don't think principals are afforded that same yeah. benefit. They're yeah. really caught in the middle. But so I, I sit on, I mean, what it just still comes down yeah. to this top down decision exactly. making because I sit yeah. on a common core. We're transitioning to new standards. I sit on a committee for that. I'm um, on our math team for the district. So I, help give input but a lot of that is just uh, I, I you know more of for show because mm -hmm. the decisions that are being made aren't aren't going back with students best interest and what is practical in the classroom there's other factors being involved in these top-down decisions being made I think you know when you know I, I hesitate or I smiled when you said failure rate because the mathematician in me yeah, yeah. you know I'm like well we all know how statistics yeah. statistics can be used or manipulated sure. to show sure. increases or decreases or how it's being measured and are we evaluating this on a five-year graduation plan versus a four-year but regardless obviously we, we want more kids to be mm -hmm. successful we, sure. we want a great society but then when you look at all the things we start doing to students very, very early on, like telling a third grader, like, you don't meet, <laughs> like, yeah. you're not mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that message comes really mm -hmm. early on. And then, and then we're like, but stay in school, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, oh, you got all Fs, but stay in school, you know, it matters mm -hmm. or something. And then, you know, there's, there's no art, there's no music, there's not these other things that give you buy-in, that bu build your self-confidence and give you leadership opportunities and think like, well, this class is hard for me, but I'm really good at this other class, mm -hmm. or, you know, but my teacher thinks I'm really good at this sport, and so that's keeping me motivated. Um, as, we, as we strip down all these other things that give buy-in, and, and then all we're telling kids is, well, just trust us, you need to graduate, mm -hmm. you need to graduate, mm -hmm. you need to graduate, without really affording them the opportunities to realize why, or, or giving, like, more... Um, career preparation or VOTEC opportunities. I mean, I think we we try, or there's some opportunities, but obviously that's an area that we could really improve mm -hmm. upon. Well, you know, it's really refreshing to hear these kind of things because, my, again, the viewing audience, I've, I've been to many school board meetings with Steve, and you sit down there for days on and mm -hmm. days on, way into the night, and this, that, and that. I'm still trying to figure out what are you talking about, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and the results, if you will, and, and seeing Steve testify on many cases, trying to, in all due respect, just kind of, talking about his background and we're going to have Steve here on a little bit more but but it, it's going to be refreshing if you will to to get some of the issues to the table have someone represent the teachers for a change uh, on the school board and that's how we react because the voters are out here mm -hmm. saying basically look when we're being asked to come up with dollars if you will to either build new schools or uh, this or this that and the other uh, they the end result is that what's the result of my dollars I mean, am I getting a respectable citizen? Are they out here right. working? Are they family members, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And that's a major, major mm -hmm. concern. So, so again, I we appreciate this. And we're going to go on and now to cut this thing off at this point in time. But I want to get you to come back on and uh, <laughs> after a certain period of time. And I want you to evaluate what he does on the board oh. as to whether or not it's getting to the classroom, right? And that's the end of the result, right? Right. And Bruce, if I may, when we well, say, you know, Steve advocating for teachers, ultimately what that really means is is advocating for students, yes, right? Yes, like that's yes, like the yes. 
really that's exciting kids, part, right? Like showing it was for the kids yes. because that's what the teachers yes. care about too, yes. and that's yes. where we're yes. we're all coming from. Yes. Like what's yes. going to be yes. best for the kids? Well, we appreciate. We'll we'll, we'll give you the last word then. <laughs> okay, <fine. laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, okay thank you. good. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. On their test scores, basically, are we going to? close them and privatize them. It's happened all across the country. Is that the direction we're going? I mean, it's it's a really spooky time in education, and so you have to kind of be careful where you're going. And somebody's got, to, somebody's got to say no. Is that going to counter the failure rate, the way the public is being looked at the school district? For the no, it's going to make the failure day rate worse. Mm -hmm. In fact, the new Common Core stuff, supposedly the predictions are, and I know, I'm not a big prediction guy, is <laughs> going to go way down, hmm. way down. And so more kids are going to fail. And these teachers right here can tell you when those kids fail, it's not a, it's, it's, it's how good, when they fail and the school's pointing at them, you're the failure, then how good is that? Do they Draw, pull themselves back up, and uh, uh, the twelve-year-old pull themselves back up and say, "Oh well, that's okay. I'm going to go in." Yeah, some of them, but a lot of them just put their head down and cry. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, again, as, as as you all were sharing this deal about um, what you do in the classroom, and then you've got the person who makes the decision as to whether or not, you know, as far as this is what you do, do it, mm -hmm. as opposed to what should we do, and then come up with some device, if you will, that can resolve, it, and then make a decision. Fair. And that's what you bring to the table. Well, you think I'm you're going to be able to accomplish that, Steve? <laughs> I have no idea. I think you can. Let's hope, yeah. let's yeah. hope yeah. we can make some changes. If we make some changes, uh, that'll be good. I, I hope we can. I, I hope we can. Well, I think the way you can do it is just like we're doing it here now, educating the public out here, the voting public, if you will. Because that's how you got elected in many ways. When I think about uh, your endorsements and whatever, I noticed the Oregonian didn't endorse you. The one I mean, we didn't endorse you, and whatever the Tri Tribune did endorse you, and I endorse you. The Tribune's sure. pretty smart. I know, but, yeah, that's a, but, but the point of the matter is, is that I, 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 I sort of felt from them in terms of how they endorsed it, they didn't even recognize the fact that you were in the classroom. You, you know what I'm saying, saying? And then we've been living like that culture for so long mm -hmm. that it says as if to say that the teacher shouldn't be making the decision, we know best what to do. And then, but at the same time, we've had these problems. And, but at the same time, the public is saying, Hey, I, I want I want solid citizens when they graduate. They can you know they can they can they can balance a checkbook and they can go to work and they can be respectful and on and on and on and on and on. We, we were doing those things back when. Yeah, I think that we were doing them better. We were doing them at better at some that point. point in time. But it's not because we don't want them to do them better. Right, right. It's right. because that some other people are pushing to do other things that aren't necessarily the most thoughtful and the best things to do. And then the other thing I've heard, I've heard just from you many times over, you know, I've got this other thing that I've got to do. I've got to be mother, I've got to be father, I've got to take care of dental, I've got to do this and I've got to do this. And it takes time away from my spending the time in the classroom that I should be with these kids. Are we going to be able to respond to that? You going to be able to get that across to these folks? That well, one working? of the things that I'm hopeful for is that we move from that we move to the idea that kids need to be in school. Okay. Next year, we've got eight days out of school for those kids who are in the focus priority, the lowest test score people in the district. And we're going to have out of the classroom sent home for eight days so we can train teachers who were not necessarily training in the right directions always anyway. And so I, one of the things I'd like to work on is let's get the kids in the classroom. Right, right. And to begin with, you're, the kids who are the farthest behind, we're going to give them the least amount of school. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like the kids who are the farthest behind would get the most amount of school. Not the least. You know, the, another point that, you know, again, from we, as we talk, I, I heard also, too, uh, the, the motivation or the enthusiasm of the child when they walk into the classroom. And when I was coming to school, voc ed was my thing because voc ed was the one that pushed me, if you will, into reading and whatever because I was very excited about it. By voc ed, he means also, we okay. always have this discussion, Bruce and I. I never. Voc ed, he mean, also means. Oh, uh, Music, shop, and, music shop, yeah, wood shop, all those, home ec, things, all this yeah. stuff. Not, I mean, not just the regular thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, so like, as an auto mechanic and whatever, I can still remember auto mechanic, and all of a sudden, chemistry, I became real good in chemistry. I, I became good in math because you had to get a micrometer and all this, that, and the other. So, consequently, when I went to my English 
instructor, all of a sudden I'm I'm motivated to, to to read well. Okay, that kind of a deal. So, but they took this out of the school system. I a mean, lot how of you, it. How are you gonna How are you gonna get that back to the table? So, she's got some motivated kids when they come into the classroom. Just boom, they, they're not even ready to go. What What are you gonna do about that? You One know? of the things that I've talked about on here a lot and period, and I didn't push it as much in right. in my campaign was that the middle schools is where the middle grades right. is where the mess is. Right. I, I, I mean, it's. Why do you say that? What do you, it, well, what do you because mean? you have to engage those kids in school, and if you don't engage them, they're not getting. They're not going to care about it, and it's it's where they begin to drop out. It's the teachers teaching the sixth, seventh, eighth graders that are critical and having things for them to do that are interesting, right, right, and that they care about in school is is incredibly important and we just kind of push that that's over someplace else mm -hmm. on some it's not even on the back burner it's over on the far side of well, the that's train good representation because when they first start like first grade primary etc et they're all sponges mm -hmm. they'll take in as much as you want but then after a while they get tired say well what, where's the rest of the stuff there's nothing there that's what you're talking about the as school, they right? get older you as get, they get the a little older school, right why do you want to go on to high school if you haven't had a chance to play sports in middle right, school right, be right. involved Dang. in the band oh, yes. be in drama begin to spark those interests that that you have and if you don't spark them there then they have they don't go to high school with the same attitude so i used to have kids when i taught middle school in portland which i did would turn and say why do i want to do any more of this Hmm. Why do I want to go to any more school? I mean, this is nuts. And But when I went up in Vancouver, and we've talked about this before, when I went to Vancouver, they had all sorts of sports. Half the kids in the school, f probably 500 out of 1,000, were involved in the music programs. And we had art programs. We had full football teams and basketball teams and volleyball teams and wrestling teams. And mm -hmm. kids would wear their, their uh, jacket to yeah, class. Exactly. And I'm on, yes, I'm on yes. the wrestling team. Yes, right. And it engage them in the school mm -hmm. and so then you can maybe get them to do the English assignment yeah, too. Right, right, exactly. On exactly. top of that, mm -hmm. uh, but if you just hand them the English assignment and they're going, mm, yeah, I don't know. And, and that's, that's what we do in Portland and it's really sad in my opinion. Okay, so you, you still voted for him? Yes. You still <laughs> voted for him? Yes. Now we got about, we got about, uh, about maybe about six minutes or so at this point in time. Would you all like to ask him a couple questions? Like I said, he's here. We, we're live, if you will. And uh, basically, you're representing the teachers and whatever. You got any, anything on your mind that you might would have would have liked to have asked him during that particular time? Like, like now, what what do you think? One of the great things about Steve um, is that he was always open to us asking any questions or open dialogue, which I think parents and community and teachers have felt that frustration with some of the people on the school board that mm -hmm. they weren't being listened to. So, I, I mean, I never felt like Steve had closed his door for many of our questions um, ever, which is really wonderful. Do you Matt, what do you think, Matthew? Do you want me to ask him a question? question? Ask him a question. All right. Um, so you taught middle school how long? Oh, probably over probably 35 years. And that explains everything, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be crazy to teach middle school. That's Everybody all of us knows right here, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that. So, so how would you? We ha right now we have actually here's a question. Uh, what to do with we have K-8 schools, right? Oh, yeah. And we also have six know. eight schools. So I've always been uh, I've always asked myself, okay, what's better, K-8? You know, it's good that the older siblings can walk their younger siblings to school, right? But that's a shorter day. That's a shorter day, and mm -hmm. because of uh, the funding formula, it's harder to get those kids electives, especially the six, seven, eight, and K-8. Right. Then we have some six, seven, eight schools that have a longer day and more electives. So uh, what should we do? How, how should we balance that? Well, I thought the first step, and I wish I had a full answer, because it's so embedded all over the district now, it's difficult to you, you go back to middle schools, you've got parents who like, hey, I felt that you should have a middle school at least at every, in every attendance area. Mm -hmm. And so you could, so you had that option, that middle school option for kids who really wanted that, and you need to put those things in. You notice that there's, are there any K-8s up in the West Hills? I don't think so. I think they're all middle schools. Mm -hmm. Wilson, does Wilson have any K-8s up feed in? I think they're mostly mm -hmm. middle schools, mm -hmm. and, and and so you got Selwood Middle School feeding into Cleveland. I mean, it's we need to look and say we we need to restart 
that whole discussion again, which is the caves. Where do we have caves? Why do we have them? Uh, I mean, originally they came out of when Vicki Phillips was here, and supposedly K8s were supposed to be, uh, the research showed K8s were supposed to be better. That's what they said. Well, that was phony research. Uh, could they not read the research? I don't know. You know, did they not understand it? Did they do it? Bill Gates was pushing that, small schools, K-8s, and then the, the, so we, we went to the K-8s on erroneous information. And I don't think they'll go away from them again unless they begin to say that engagement in those middle schools is critical. Have you been to Binsmead? Binsmead has this huge area that they built around the arts. Mm. I mean, it's unbelievable mm. what it is. It was huge. That's they, the public schools? Yeah, Binsmead was, uh, and it, when it was a middle school, they had this huge art area. Mm. I mean, the whole building is practically built around the, the, that huge uh, area, which has, they had all sorts of different arts and shop and stuff, mm. because they said, hey, kids needed to do that. Mm. If I could go like that, I'd switch everything back to middle school. I'll tell you what, we've got about a minute and a half left, Steve. And I would like for you now to say something to the voting public, to the to the people who are paying the bill out there. Say something to them in terms of Well, I just hope the they'll start to pay attention to this testing stuff. Okay. And I and I hope they they will look and say and support the teachers in in this way, that saying that the teachers are the, they care about the teachers. When they go out and talk to citizens, you know they care about their kid's teacher. And most people tell you, yeah, my kid's got a good teacher, yeah. But they need to support the teachers by saying, we want the teachers involved in decision making. We want those teachers up front. Not because they supported me, but because that's the way it should be. Because they have the background and they have the understanding. They're the ones on the front lines caring about your kid. And so they're the ones that know a lot better than people like me sitting up at the school board level about what should be taking place in the schools. And, and so far, and we haven't listened very well lately. I mean, the Teachers Association says, hey, we're having trouble with the testing. What can we do about it? Nobody's paid any attention mm -hmm. to that that I can see. Common will, Core will, standards. Will you now represent right? them on the board? Will, well, no, can, can I represent I represent everybody on the board, of course. Will you represent and the I teachers? represent the kids first. Oh, yeah, I like kids that. first, teachers second. Kids first, teachers second. Okay. That's the way I've always felt that it should so be. Kids be first, teachers second. Might irritate some parents, but they're not in that school every day, day in, day out. Mm -hmm. They're at home, so it's kids first, teachers second. Then you move to the administration. And right. move outside this week. Steve, thank you. Hey, you got quite a job, but we'll be here for him, right? Yeah. We'll all be here for him. And hopefully, you'll be here once a month. And there's a little update. Fair? No, ruin your ratings. Fair. Ruin your ratings. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, thank you very much for being with us. We'll join you next week. Have a good one.